It's always about the software, isn't it? I mean, we're all enamored with hardware design, and hardware is super cool and complicated and all, but these days we all have to bow down and step aside when software comes waltzing through. Bah. Of course, that also means that software is usually the biggest problem in our electronic designs as well, and in a double whammy kind of way. First, software is an increasingly large component of our system designs and requires the most time and resources to develop and debug and verify. Second, we depend on software tools to do just about every engineering task, including building an FPGA-based prototype to allow, you guessed it, those software developers to get their part of the job done. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today my guest is Jürgen Jaeger of Cadence Design Systems, and we're going to talk about the importance of software in FPGA-based prototyping. It's a big deal, and it's easy to overlook as we're staring glassy-eyed at huge boards with giant FPGAs parked on them. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that you can click on that Download Now button below your player. There you can download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. Welcome, Jürgen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hello, Emilia. So, Jürgen, software is a big part of most every single electronic product today, right? What kinds of trends are you seeing? That is definitely true. Take, for example, the success of smartphones and tablets. Mm -hmm. It has, on the one hand, increased the complexity of today's SOCs, and on the other hand, also elevated the importance of any kind of embedded software. Sure, yeah. Consequently, the smooth cooperation between hardware and software components is essential and requires new ways of verifying and validating these systems. Yeah. And FPGA-based prototyping plays a key role in it. And so prototyping is, for the most part, really all about software. Mm -hmm. Getting to chip tape out is not the biggest problem anymore. Right. Software has started to dominate the development costs and schedule. Mm -hmm. Software also has become a key differentiator and, if done right, a competitive advantage for you. Very true. Therefore, it's critically important to get a head start in developing the software to start software development and hardware software integration long before the actual silicon is available. And that is what FPGA-based prototypes are really used for. Ah, I see. So I was just about to ask you that, Jürgen. What are FPGA-based prototypes used for? What are you seeing them being used for? Well, there are two major use modes really for FPGA-based prototyping. The primary use mode for FPGA-based prototyping is really for software development and validation, meaning to provide a pre-silicon version of the SOC to the embedded software developers mm -hmm. to execute software, including booting operating systems and running applications on it. Yeah. As you can imagine, that requires to run the prototype at the highest possible performance, typically in the 10 plus megahertz range. In order to achieve this, compromises are often made in terms of taking out parts of the SOC that are not needed for specific software tests. Sure. For example, if you write a driver for the PCIe port in the device, mm -hmm. you don't need the Ethernet Mac in it. Right, yeah. So these are the kind of simplifications that you can do. There's also an interesting secondary use mode where prototypes can come in very handy, and that is for running long hardware regressions at much higher speed than even an emulation system like Palladium can deliver. Ah, okay. In that case, FPGA-based prototypes are really used to augment and complement hardware verification. Okay. Jürgen, I have heard about the pain of prototyping. It's great once it's up and running, but that road can be pretty darn painful, right? That is definitely true. Also, FPGA-based prototyping is a widely used methodology, mm -hmm. and everybody is happy once it's up and running. Right. It's often very challenging and time-consuming to get there. Mm -hmm. Challenges that with all current prototyping tools and solutions is that it simply takes way too long to bring up the design in FPGAs. Ah. And it often requires changes to the RTL code, in part because there's no easy transition from simulation mm -hmm. and emulation to the existing environment, but also because a lot of transformations of the design are needed. 
Right. So typically you go through a lot of steps that are time consuming. That includes compiling the design, that includes converting your memories, partitioning the design into multiple FPGAs. Mm -hmm. And after all of that is done, then really the fun starts because mm -hmm. now you have to verify and validate that the design is really functional after all of these transformations. Sure, yeah. All of this can easily add up to three months or more, mm. which is expensive. Yeah. And of course, you also lose a lot of productivity because you start later with your verification. Absolutely. So what can we do to help this pain of this process? Using the right flow and some advanced tools can really reduce the bring up time significantly. Okay. So let's take a fresh look at all these individual phases a designer and you are usually going through and how you can reduce them, make them easier. Sure, okay. You typically want to start with a proven AC compile flow instead of a traditional FPGA synthesis flow, okay. which provides not only faster compile times, but it also minimizes the need for RTL changes. Ah, okay. Which in return also reduces the possibility of introducing new bugs. Yeah. Automatic ASIC to FPGA memory conversion gets rid of weeks and weeks of memory remodeling and again eliminates another source of new bugs. Mm -hmm. Using a fast automatic partitioning and board routing tool will dramatically reduce the partitioning step and really cuts it down to a few days only to get through that phase. Nice, okay. One of the most time-consuming compile steps is the FPGA place and route, mm. which is typically an overnight run. In some cases, it takes longer. <laughs> and so before you even start an FPGA place and route, you want to be sure that your design is functional, that yeah. what you map into the FPGAs really works. And the solution here is that the tool flow is generating a post-partition uh, netlist for verification. And you do that, as I mentioned, before you even go into FPGA place and out, and that helps you to diagnose issues early on and before even going into any FPGA tool flow. Nice. Finally, the bring up of the prototype hardware, that hasn't changed much really. I mean, mm. you still have to connect your external interfaces. The big right. difference is you get to this point now much, much quicker than before. Nice. So, Jürgen, what does a typical system look like that people are developing? Typical system that we often see these days has multiple processors in it. It has memory subsystems. It has various external interfaces, mm -hmm. graphics port, radios, Ethernet. It also has some ports that are used for debug purposes like JTAG and UART. Mm -hmm. So it's really a complete SOC system and in the end you boot an operating system like an embedded Linux, embedded Windows, whatever your platform is on those systems. Right. Okay, Jürgen, say I've got my SOC design and I want to prototype it with an FPGA-based prototyping system. What are the steps I go through? Show me what the flow looks like. The typical FPGA-based prototyping flow includes three major steps. The first step is the RTL compilation, sometimes also called synthesis. Yeah. You simply convert your RTL code into gates at this point. Most of the signs are too big to fit into a single FPGA, so you have to break them up. You do your partitioning into multi-FPGAs. Mm -hmm. And the last step then is to do the FPGA place and route, which create the bit files, which are downloaded to the FPGAs to configure them. There are some optional things that sometimes are done, like inserting probes, because yeah. you want to have visibility into what happens while the prototype is running. So here we can now go through a typical flow. In this case, we are using the Cadence Rabbit prototyping platform to see what is really happening in each of the various phases. All right. The first step is to compile and synthesize the design. For RPP, this uses a proven Palladium compiler. This assures compatibility with simulation and emulation. It enables the reuse of existing scripts, constraints, clock definitions, memory definitions, and so on. Okay. Oh, and by the way, the HGL compiler also runs very fast. It runs it up to about 30 million gates per hour on a single workstation. Nice, okay. In this phase, you would also specify which signal should be probed for debug purposes. Ah, all right. The output of this step is a netlist that is now optimized for FPGAs already and already has the memories converted into FPGA memories. Right, okay. The next step is partitioning the design into multiple FPGAs. 
Okay. It's typically the design will not fit into a single FPGA. True. But partitioning is only part of what's happening here. Other tasks performed in this step are converting gated clocks and latches into FPGA-friendly structures, dealing with internal tri states, adding pin multiplexing between the FPGAs, and finally connecting all the external interfaces like PCIe, UART, graphics, Ethernet, and so on. All of this is done automatically in the RPP flow. Okay. Of course, the user has the option to help and guide the partitioner, usually with the goal to further improve performance of the prototype. This phase generates two things. The individual netlists, one per FPGA, that then go into FPGA place and route. Okay. And secondly, a verification model, in this case a very log netlist, that is used to validate that after all the previous steps and transformations, the functionality of the design got preserved. Mm. This netlist is now an accurate representation of what goes into the FPGAs. It includes FPGA memories, replicated logic, converted clocks, pin multiplexing logic, probing, triggering logic, and so on. Sure. Very important here is that this validation of functionality is done before you run any time-consuming FPGA place and route. This now enables a new level of productivity as all the debug and potential iterations to achieve prototyping functionality and performance are done pre place and route, which means you can do multiple iterations per day. Nice. Finally, we are running the FPGA place and route to generate the individual bit files for the FPGAs. Setup for the place and route tool is also done fully automatically, freeing the user from having to deal with place and route constraints, switches, and time consuming experimentation to get good results. Yeah. And of course, once the bit files have been created, you will simply download it into the FPGA board and run. Fantastic. Okay, Jürgen, I hear a lot that memories are quite a big headache. How does the RPP flow help in this case? You know, if you look at ASIC memories, they are really like snowflakes. Uh -huh. They all look alike, and yet they are all very different. <laughs> Add to that that FPGAs have only two or three types of memory blocks, and all of them are dual port memories, and it becomes obvious that memories are a big headache in prototyping. Mm -hmm. Therefore, to work in FPGA environment, we need to add some stuff to it. In particular, two things. You need a multiplexer to implement multiport behavior in the FPGA, and you need some write-enabled circuitry to make sure that the write access occurs at the right time and in sync with valid address and data information. Makes sense. As you can imagine, modeling all design memories manually can be a long and time-consuming, and with long, I mean weeks, yeah. process except when using the Cadence RPP flow, in which case it's done quickly and fully automatically. Great. Okay, clocking for SOCs have become a seriously complex issue, especially for low power designs. Is there something in RPP that helps the design in this regard? Absolutely. As you mentioned, clocking is the next big headache. And it's not just the traditional gated clock conversion, which is actually pretty straightforward but also the distribution of many clocks across multiple FPGAs on a printed circuit board. Sure, yeah. When a design is partitioned into multiple FPGAs, primary clocks required for the design have to be driven to all the FPGAs. Mm. These clocks need to have very tight phase relationships between the FPGAs, and designs typically have tens to hundreds of primary clocks with a wide range of frequency requirements. Having that many clock sources on the board and distributing them to all the FPGAs is not a feasible solution. Yeah. So what's the better implementation? Yeah. Better implementation is using the built-in PLLs in the FPGAs to generate these clocks locally. Ah, oh, okay. This will require only one global clock to be routed to all the FPGAs, with the FPGA internal PLLs now using this clock as reference clock to derive the other clocks from it. I see, okay. Which, of course, also requires adding additional IP into all the FPGAs. So again, if you want to do that manually, you're really talking about weeks to implement that and test it out that it really works. Right. So you guys have had a lot of experience with customers in this area. Is there a recipe for success that I 
could be using that you can share? Certainly. As you can already guess by now, FPGA based prototyping is really all about software. Mm -hmm. Not only when it comes to what prototypes are mainly used for, but especially also when it comes to getting a prototype up and running. Yeah. To say it very bluntly, almost everybody can really hack to get a board with FPGAs on it. Sure, okay. <laughs> the big question then is, how do I get my ASIC or SSC design mapped into these FPGAs and working correctly? Right. And the key to success with FPGA-based prototyping lies in the software. In this case, the software to take an existing SSC design and map it into the prototype system. You will have a hard time if you go into that with the wrong expectations have an ad hoc flow for multiple vendors, maybe try to design and build your own boards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you have realistic expectations, understand what the challenges are, understand that some changes and simplifications might be required. And most importantly, you should do your homework, pick <laughs> the right tools, the right hardware and software for what you want to do with it. And that will really enable you to take advantage of everything FPGA-based prototyping today has to offer. So, Jürgen, it sounds like FPGA-based prototyping can do it all, but can it really? Of course not. FPGA-based <laughs> prototyping is not the answer to everything. There is no one-size-fits-all, as we refer to in Germany. There is no Eierlegen de Wollmilchsau, <laughs> this fabled animal you see on the picture here. <laughs> Software enablement and success with today's complex embedded system designs requires multiple platforms and, most importantly, interoperability between the platforms. And that requires a partner, not just a tool provider that has all the tools and the expertise to help you be successful. Right. Okay, Jürgen, I think I'm ready to get started. Where should I go for more information? You can simply click on the link to cadence.com where you find a lot of information about not only the Rabbit prototyping platform, but also for all the other tools and services that we have to offer to be successful and to succeed in today's challenging market environment. Fantastic. Well, I think that's all I have time for. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jürgen. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Likewise. Thank you, Amelia. And before we go, don't forget to click that Download Now button below the player to download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. For Chalk Talk, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out the On Demand section of eejournal.com. <laughs>